Now that's some dancing I can get down with. <laughs> We are back with some more Samuelella, and today we're going to be checking out pre-industrial surgeries and hysteria throughout history. Hey kids, had a bad day? Well, could be worse. You could be living in a world without modern anesthetic. That's today, true. We'll be talking about some surgical procedures carried out long before the development of medicine as we know it today. Now, once you go back a certain distance, the line between operation and mutilation is pretty thin. So, for our purposes, surgery refers to any bodily manipulation carried out with the intent of fixing some injury or illness. Not and away we go. Oh, wow. The very first <laughs> surgery that we have historical evidence for dates as far back as 6500 BC. It's called trepanning, which is a nice word for carving someone's frickin' skull open using nothing but a rock. Maybe a rock on a stick if you were lucky. In all seriousness, though, you can see that a good deal of care went into the procedure. I assume they died from holes. Oh, God, holes. Why does he have, like, little dots of holes on his skull? I can't look at it no more, but, oh, okay. But they dead? Well, they are dead now. It's their skull, but did they die from that? I don't know. Just know that this isn't just the result of random injury. Many skulls even showed signs of healing around the holes, meaning plenty of the people who underwent this whole thing just got up and went about their day afterwards. All right, hold on, you say. This all sounds batch, uh, guano insane. No way this was that common of an occurrence. Well, friend, if you've been watching this channel long enough, you should know that if you give human beings the benefit of the doubt, chances are they'll prove you wrong. In <laughs> fact, so far, over 1,500 trepanned skulls have been dug up all across the globe, from Europe to China and even the Americas. Mm -hmm. This means that between 5 and 10% of all skulls that we've found from the Neolithic period have had at least one man-made hole scraped into them. To put it this way, based on that data, there's a greater probability of someone born in the late Stone Age having their brain matter exposed by some shaman with a chunk of flint than someone born in the USA being a redhead. To this day, nobody really knows why this was such a common practice, but most theories tend to revolve around the idea of releasing some kind of dark supernatural force from the patient. Man, I'm getting real sick of all these evil entities infecting our minds and bodies. <laughs> You can say that again. I tell you, I need these demons like I need a hole in the head. <laughs> no <right>. way. <laughs> Fast forward to 600 BC. Over in India... Didn't it feel like doing a trace? This is close enough, right? Not sure. In India, there lived a guy called Maharshi Susuruta. Now, this guy was a medical... How to remove a hangnail without ripping your whole fucking finger open. House MD episode, yeah, like that. Alright, why asparagus make your pee pee smell? Oh, okay. Proper dump frequency inbred or weird looking and other this guy was a medical mastermind he wrote a treatise known as susruta samita which described countless different conditions treatments and yes even surgeries one of which is the first recorded instance of rhinoplasty that means nose job a hornbill's a type of bird i'm here too anyway here's how it's done according to susruta first you get them plastered, obviously. Second, you use a leaf to measure out the part of the nose you want fixed. Then, you use the leaf to cut off a flap of skin from the cheek or forehead of the patient. This part's important though, you gotta remember to leave a little piece of it still attached. Otherwise, you just got a chunk of dirty dead face meat on your hands. Now, wherever you're looking to stick the new flesh on, you rub that part raw with a knife. Also, you're gonna wanna stick two plant stalks in their nostrils so their nose keeps its proper shape. Slap the skin on, suture it, dust it with licorice powder for some reason, and cover it with cotton. Sesame oil should be regularly applied until the skin is fully healed. If you're like me, I already do that by default, so it shouldn't be an issue. Finally, at long last, your sniffer is reborn. Don't worry, you still look like a freak. Did the eye move over during the surgery? Oh no, the eye's always been over there. Don't worry, you still look like a freak. Just slightly less so. Moving on, our next surgery took place in 10th century Spain on Sancho I of Leon, otherwise known as Sancho the Fat. Now, normally back in the day, having some meat on your bones was a sign of wealth and power and all that. Yeah. But this guy was like TLC documentary tier, to the point where he could hardly function as a human being. So his constituents said, Greetings, your thickness. Uh, yeah, you can't be king anymore on account of you keep breaking every horse we give you, and nobody wants to wash between your 
your accordion like neck folds no more. After his adipose got him deposed, Sancho decided to seek medical help for his condition under the oversight of well reputed physician Hazdai Ibn Shapirut, which is an anagram for ha. Paintbrush aids. Now, if there's one thing that medieval man understood, it's practicality. Lap band, gastric bypass, belly balloon, these all exist to help people who don't have the self control to stop eating so much on their own. But Dr. Do? Shapadu didn't believe in beating around the bush. He said, Well, why don't we just stop the patient from shoving food into his own greasy maw in the first place? And decided to just up and stitch the dude's lips together. After the operation, the only nutrients that Sancho received came through a straw in the form of a mixture known as thoriaca, which was a complex blend of several herbs, fruits, and seeds, including opium. It was basically the closest thing you could find to lean at the time, and lean he became, losing around half his weight before ascending to the throne once more. So this is the part of the video where I pander to the desires of the audience. If there's one thing I know you internet people can't get enough of, it's things going inside people's eyeballs. Let's talk about cataract surgery. The art of dealing with people's clouded lenses has been around for millennia, oh, believe chills. it or not. That Susruta guy from earlier actually talked about the most common procedure for cataracts for most of civilized history, you about to which touch is known my as eye. the couching method. Couching is done by taking a sharp object like a needle or a thorn and ever so gently stabbing their eye hole at weird angles until the lens moves out of the way. No lasers, no sedatives, no paralytics, just a rusty old pin and some elbow grease the way God intended. The majority of the time, this operation didn't work, usually just damaging the already blind eye irreparably. Shocker, right? Yeah. And even if it did go as planned, you still, you know, didn't have a lens in your eye. So you essentially went from, I can't tell if I'm dead or not, <laughs> to, ah, yes, it is quite yellow out today. <laughs> By God. Something moved somewhere. A slightly more refined version of this operation is the suction method, which dates back to at least the 10th century AD, if not older. This procedure is described as requiring, quote, a large incision in the eye, a hollow needle, and an assistant with an extraordinary lung capacity. Though this reads like the setup to the world's most horrifying party trick, it's actually the bare minimum number of tools needed to completely extract the lens from the eye. In case you didn't pick up on how, here's a diagram. This method generally saw a greater success rate and fewer complications than its non-extracting counterpart. I, I can't, I can't, I... So hopefully you can sleep well tonight knowing that the number of human beings who have sucked a piece of somebody's living eyeball through a straw is above zero. Anywho, let's all just be thankful that we live in an era where procedures like these are a thing of the past. Yes. Now remember kids, even though the surgeries I described here do sound pretty easy to pull off, please don't try them at home. But if you do, please put it on live leak afterwards. But you know what you can do at home? Learn stuff about things with Brilliant.org. I'm scared of that website. Mass hysteria throughout history. Ooh. Is this a little calmer? If you've ever been Black Friday shopping or visited the Diablo subreddit recently, I don't have time to play video games anymore with medical school and have a family now. But what could you all at Blizzard be thinking? There's no hope left in you. And I'm just glad I wasn't even depending on you for anything because even with zero expectations, you have somehow made me feel depressed about gaming in general. Every night before I go to bed, after long days, I Google and pray you have had the courage, integrity to address your community, but you don't. You just act like children. Be adults and face your fading fan base. You just sit in silence. I used to regret choosing medicine over graphic video game design. But thank you for showing me otherwise. I guess both professions got to sell their soul to those above them in spite of those they should only be caring about. Shame on you for not choosing to be better than the industry that came before you. T.I. Dr. Activision is more toxic than Trump. Somebody's upset shopping or visited the Diablo subreddit recently, chances are you've encountered mass hysteria at some point. Mass hysteria is known medically as mass psychogenic illness, or MPI for short. It's basically just when a bunch of people start acting a fool for no discernible reason other than maybe a stressful environment. Being that this sort of thing is natural, Isn't that happening now? there's loads of documented cases found all throughout history. Let's take a look at a few. This first one is what made me make this video in the first place. So one day sometime in the middle ages, a group of nuns in a a French convent were enjoying a quiet, uneventful day, until one of them decided to start meowing. You know, like a cat. 
You'd think this would last all of four seconds before another nun was like, Excuse me, Sister Gertrude, would you kindly cut the shit? But instead, another nun joined in, and another, until basically the entire nunnery was exchanging mouths like a group of communist trading card enthusiasts. This wasn't just a one-time thing either, it basically became integrated into their way of life. It said that on a given day, they would stand there meowing in each other's faces for hours at a time. Could you imagine being the first outsider to witness this? You might laugh now, but as they say, Everybody gangsta till the nuns start meowing. I'd void my bowels and move to Malaysia without even thinking. Miles more terrifying than this pile of garbage. As you can imagine though, after a while it stopped being scary and just got annoying, leading to the neighbors calling in a band of soldiers to deal with the situation. Hey guys, can we talk to you for a sec about it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, all due respect, but we have orders to literally beat the hell out of you with whips till you start acting like people again. No Sorry way. sir, it's just... Force of habit. Haha, <laughs> habit. Seriously though, we would rather go to hell for throttling a gaggle of nuns than put up with another minute of your bullshit, Caprese. Our next event took place Fair in the enough. parish of Fatima, Portugal in the year 1917. It all started with three shepherd children, ages 10, 9, and 7 respectively. Okay. They were like, greetings fellow Portugueseites. Uh, we've been seeing visions of the Virgin Mary, and she told us to tell you that some real crazy shit's gonna go down in the sky on October 13th. Now, if three random farm children started spouting out prophecies to the public today, you'd say, ha, huh, what tomfoolery. Go play in some dirt, you dirty little dirt baby. But keep in mind, the past is a different country. And Portugal's a different country. So that's like different country squared you gotta think about. Plus, this was during World War a different country. So that's like different. The past is a different country. And Portugal's a different country, so that's like different country squared you gotta think about. Plus this was during World War I, a time where a lot of people were holding out for a miracle to be- Can't find his jewel? To the point where, when the day finally came, at least 30,000 people gathered in Fatima to witness the alleged miracle. Lo and behold, on that day, the sun began zooming around, careening towards Earth and sending rays of multicolored light cascading across the sky, creating a light show like nobody's ever seen. Keep in mind, this happened in the 20th century, way after the era where belief in divine jiggery and or pokery was considered mandatory, so naturally there were plenty of skeptics and non-believers present, and even they saw it all happen. Or so they thought. How do we know the sun didn't really whiz around haphazardly that day, hmm? Well, number one, use your frickin' brain. And number two, accounts differed wildly from person to person. While some say the sun zigged hither, others say it zagged thither. And others still said it shined a brilliant yellow and stayed perfectly still. As such, it was eventually concluded that the event was just a combination of MPI and weird eye stuff from too much sun staring. Although I'd like to believe it was real, just that Jesus' illusion skill was way higher than his alteration at the time. Yep, that's it. Sam's going to hell. Why, for blasphemy? <laughs> Trust me, that was the least offensive part of that joke. Our next tale took place in 1962 in Tanganyika, which was basically just the beta version of Tanzania. The nation had just declared its independence from Britain the previous year, and with the future so uncertain, tensions were naturally running high around this time. One little girl in a Tanganyikan school ended up handling the stress in a bit of an unusual way. Rather than overeating or staring at her ceiling for hours like a normal person, she just started laughing and laughing and laughing. Oh. Pretty soon, her classmates at the all-girls school she attended Lol. began to join in, to the point where 95 of the 159 students caught the Gigglies, which lasted anywhere from a few hours to 16 days straight. What? Beyond just the unprovoked cat, other odd behavior included aimless running and occasional violence. The problem got so severe that the school was forced to close down temporarily, leading to the chortlers roaming the streets, spreading the affliction further. Oh, Thousands God. of people from all strata came to be affected, with 13 additional schools being being shut further, thousands temporarily, leading to the chortlers roaming the streets, spreading the affliction further. Thousands of people from all strata came to be affected, with 13 additional schools being shut down in the progress. Over the course of the hysteria, wow. several other symptoms began to present themselves as well, ranging from obvious ones such as breathing problems, fainting, random screaming, to more anomalous things like rashes. Despite all this, no physical cause could be found, leaving MPI as the only explanation. The epidemic finally died down after between 6 and 18 months months what? of day in day out laughter depending on the village. While this whole thing likely sucked for most people involved, it probably could have been worse. A lot of the time when I'm alone, I'll think to myself, man, if I ever go full schizo, I hope I'm one of the laughy ones. Go out like the Sims. Ah! 
Flashback to the year 1518 to the city of Strasbourg at the time part of the HRE. A woman named Mrs. Trophy began fervently dancing in the streets for no discernible oh, reason shit. for hours and okay. days. All without music, of course. Her only breaks consisted of occasional food intake and passing out from exhaustion when night came. If you saw that today, you'd just be like, ha. Huh drugs. But apparently people <laughs> found it pretty inspiring because within a week, 34 others had joined in. This and after wild. a month, there were around 400. This wasn't your casual bobbing up and down neither. This shit made Zumba look like Tai Chi. Here's the best modern day simulation I could find. Now imagine that both of those people were the same person and you got the dancing plague. This would take a toll on any healthy person, let alone a medieval city dweller. But despite bleeding feet and aching bones, they just kept going. In fact, they went so hard for so long that a good portion straight up fucking died from cardiac arrest. It got to the point where around 15 dancers were kicking the bucket every day before the city decided Are they had to do something about me? it. They managed to rule out any divine or supernatural causes, which was necessary just because, you know, back in medieval times, it was fucking stupid. They eventually surmised that it was a natural disease caused by too much hot blood as per that whole four humors thing that was popular at the time. As for a cure, their prescription was, get this, more dancing. I can see where they were coming from. It's pretty sound logic. If you got a song stuck in your head, you play it till you're sick of it. Same kind of thing. But here's where they goofed. The authorities actually went out of their way to facilitate the dancing, setting up a big stage area and even hiring musicians to keep the afflicted moving. All this achieved was attracting more passerby who were like, man, mass psychogenic illness looks frickin' epic. Let's get in on that. Causing the contagion to become even more widespread. Seeing that their solution back Absolutely no dancing and especially none of that disgusting floss and horse shit I see kids doing in public. Cut that shit, cut that shit, cut that shit, cut that shit! Love foot loose. Let's dance! Now that's some dancing I can get down with. <laughs> Those who still showed signs of the mania were subsequently carted off to the Shrine of St. Vitus, where an exorcism-like ritual was performed on them. This work? ended up being highly effective, presumably for no other reason than that the dancers believed it would work, and after nearly two months, the plague was quelled. While this whole thing was most likely a case of good old-fashioned MPI, some historians believe it might have been egged on in part by ergotism, a state of psychosis brought on by eating tainted bread, which I talked a little bit about in this video. Ding. And hey, while I'm shilling okay, for my I channel, I might as well give a shout out to another as well. Today's video was sponsored by Cheddar, a network focused on producing fascinating content covering topics like technology, products, businesses, and the like through the lens of innovation. Here's one about desire paths, you know, like those lines of dead grass from people taking more convenient routes to places. It's one of those things that plenty of us have thought about but never actually explored in depth like this video. Cheddar's full of intriguing stuff like that. I highly recommend giving them a look. If you're more science oriented, they still got you covered with their Cheddar Explorer series. This one's all about how it can be sure if a species is really extinct or not. They talk a bit about animals we thought were gone that suddenly reappeared out of nowhere. Super interesting. Go check it out. Anyway, that's all for today. Right. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and thank you for watching. Some of this stuff is hard to believe, but then again, we didn't have as much knowledge as we have today. But there we go, Blaze Squad. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you blaze up the like button. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, comment flossing, and I will see you guys in the next video.